a very brief introduction. I simply want to say a couple of things about Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. I met him, um, he may not remember, at a very early fundraiser when he was running for the U.S. Senate uh, that was put on by Dane Nichols, some of you may know, an environmentalist from Rhode Island. And she said, you got to meet this guy. He's the real deal. She actually yeah. said he should be president. I don't know. We're, we're, I think it was a what? We know anybody can. I, that's right. <laughs> I think it was a White House pun or something like that. <laughs> but we have been talking, Senator, the, the entire day about the legacy of Rachel Carson, how she was able to put together a sense of wonder and imagination of incredible science and worked actively, locally and politically and at the national level and put that all together. What I want you to know about Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, I have a vision. I have a dream today that we will again be gathered in front of the White House. We have talked with Senator Steingraber about resistance, about direct action, about being re arrested, what it does for one to be in the enclosed cell. We know that the opposition to the Keystone Pipeline was driven by a combination of civil disobedience by some pretty prominent people repeatedly then there was a next wave of people who circled the White House and marched around. And all of this was coordinated in ways that were not in the past when I was younger in this movement. We ended up in February of 2012, where I was shivering with 40,000 people in February with high winds demonstrating and then marching to the White House about Keystone and climate change. At the same time, people who were arrested, people who were willing to march, circle the White House, and also there was a White House speaking at that event. That was not typical of U.S. Senators at that time. And so Sheldon Whitehouse was there with Tom Steyer and others and people of the establishment while those of us who had gathered or either been arrested or marched came together with incredible power and that drove what led ultimately to huge demonstrations in New York and some greater awareness and progress on global climate change. That is what I see emerging from this conference, from these organizations, and we have a senator in Sheldon Whitehouse who can put that all together. So I want to hear what he's got to say. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, just so we are all on the same page, I've been told that I have about 10 minutes to talk and then maybe another five or 10 minutes for Q&A. So don't be surprised when I stop talking if somebody expects you to make a comment or a question. I'm from Rhode Island, pretty robust, so we also accept rude remarks. The whole, it all works for us <laughs> in Rhode Island. So if you have read Rachel Carson's Under the Sea Wind, you have a very strong sense for what Bob said, the combination of her sense of grace and wonder in the workings of the world with a strong scientific factual understanding of how it worked. For her, it wasn't just mythology and charismatic megafauna and cuddliness. She talked about the beach fleas and the hermit crabs as much as she talked about uh, the sanderlings and the uh, shad. So um, it's really wonderful to read her work and um, feel that spirit. And I hope that wherever her spirit is, she's feeling something from all of us here gathered in her name and in her uh, memory. Um, but there's something that I think she felt that is no longer true. I think that she felt that in very significant ways, whatever insults and injuries and distresses humankind caused the physical world, particularly the oceans, that they were resilient enough that we could just stop and bring them back. It is no longer clear that that is true. It is no longer clear that the actions of humankind are reversible to the original norm. And 
That, I think, is the dramatic change from her era in the last 75 years. I have um, a personal fondness for the oceans. I represent Rhode Island, which is the ocean state. My wife is a marine scientist. I proved my cred with her when I was courting her by diving in Narragansett Bay in February. <laughs> you don't want the explanation of how you warm your wetsuit. <laughs> but one of the things about paying attention to oceans is that the ocean signal is so clear. The folks who try to deny that climate change is happening go off into the most confused areas of uh, climate computer modeling that was done in the early stages of climate modeling and how that may or may not have turned out right. And they love to dwell there. They never talk about the oceans. They never talk about the oceans. They never talk about the oceans because you measure the warming of the oceans with thermometers. It's not complicated. The law of thermodynamics is not, thermal expansion is not complicated. Things warm, they get bigger. And sure enough, with basically a glorified yardstick, you measure sea level rise. And any high school science class that has an aquarium does pH testing. Kids do it in the classroom. And that's how we know that the ocean is acidifying. So if your stock in trade is creating phony and artificial doubt, the oceans are a bad place for you. But it's a good place for us because we need to send these messages. And the more you see about the oceans, the more you see the distress. Whether it is the fact that if a whale washes ashore in Rhode Island, if you tow it out to sea to let nature take its course, or if you take it to a dumpster or a municipal dump to dispose of the body, you are likely breaking the law. You are likely breaking the hazardous waste disposal law or the clean water law because that whale is likely to be swimming toxic waste, particularly if they eat towards the top of the food chain and bioaccumulate the chemicals and the heavy metals and the carcinogens like our flame retardants. So when the whales of the sea are swimming toxic waste, when you can go off the northwest coast of America and see that more than half of the pteropods, the little flying sea snails that fly around their little snail foot, has been changed by nature's evolution into a little aquatic wing. And they fly in the oceans in great numbers. 50% of them are experiencing severe shell damage, mostly attributable to acidification of the seas. That little pteropod falls out of the bottom of the oceanic food chain, and everything on top of it falls with it. If you look at the way the seas are warming and things are changing their behavior, I went with Chris Coons this year to the Delaware shore to watch the red knot fly in. If you haven't seen the red knot fly in, it's one of the amazing things on the planet. They fly from Patagonia. They make a stop in Brazil, and they fly nonstop Brazil to Delaware Bay. They lose half their body mass beating their little wings in that wind. This is not a soaring bird. This is a little run along the shore bird. But somehow, it wends its way across that vast ocean from Brazil up to Delaware Bay, and when it lands, it is starving, and it wants to eat. It goes through a metamorphosis so that it can eat faster, and it's timed to be there when the uh, horseshoe, horseshoe crab, when the horseshoe crab is breeding, and all the eggs are all over the place. And you move that timing by changing the temperature of that sea so that the signal to the horseshoe crab is happening sooner, and down in Patagonia, the red knot didn't get that message. You now have one of the most beautiful and intricate dances on the face of this planet disrupted forever. Those are the things that are happening in the sea with creatures. And of course, 
We've got acidification that is happening at the levels we haven't seen in 50 million years. We can measure it by going into the old ice cores. Narragansett Bay is four degrees warmer mean winter water temperature than it was when Sandra started her work. Four degrees, that's an ecosystem shift. That means our lobster fishery is basically gone. It means our winter flounder fishery is basically gone. You no longer see off the Newport Bridge trawlers working the bay in the winter. There's nothing there for them. And this is happening all around the world. The Great Barrier Reef has suffered, it looks like at this point, one-third mortality and two-thirds bleaching and harm. Bleaching is a, we always come up with the worst possible words for things. Bleaching is like a heart attack. You can recover, but it's long and it's hard and you are wounded by the heart attack. You're not dead yet, but it isn't a good thing. And that's where it is, this huge wonder of the world that can be seen from space, and we have done this in a generation. So why is all this happening and why are we doing nothing about it? It's very simple. The fossil fuel industry is immensely powerful, and they have huge stakes here. The International Monetary Fund says that the subsidy for fossil fuel in the United States every year, in the United States, one country every year, is $700 billion. How much dirt would you do to protect $700 billion? How much mischief might you get up to to protect $700 billion? Well, the answer is a lot. And if you want to see that lot, look at the work of Robert Brule at Drexel and Riley Dunlap at Oklahoma State and Justin Farrell at Yale and Naomi Oreskes at Harvard and Aaron McWright at Michigan State who are actually examining as a scientific phenomenon the denial apparatus that the oil and coal and fossil fuel industry have created to hide their hand and to mislead the American public. They picked up the strategies developed early on by the chemical companies to defend DDT. And when we're talking about Rachel Carson, wouldn't DDT be a great place to start? And CHC, CFCs. And most particularly, tobacco. That was the first big industry that had a big business consequence as people figured out that its product was lethal. I, I brought that lawsuit in Rhode Island. Trust me, I feel the pain of lead. So, and asbestos, you can go on. My point is that the playbook already existed. Some of the infrastructure, as well as the methodology, already existed, but the fossil fuel industry has taken it to a new level. Robert Brule tracks 60 different organizations. Justin Farrell was tracking 100 organizations. For $700 billion a year, can you manage 60 organizations? Of course you can. It's a piece of cake. The, piece, the, the engine in your car outside has 500, million, 500 parts in it, probably. So a 60-part machine is not that complicated. But they've built that. And behind all of that process for misleading the public and fomenting lies and calculated misinformation about climate change is something new that started in 2010. I came to the Senate in 2008. There were bipartisan bills on climate change everywhere you looked. There was the McCain bill, there was the Lamar Alexander bill, there was the Susan Collins bill, there was the Lindsey Graham bill. On and on you went. There was Mark Kirk voting for cap and trade in the House. There was Flake supporting a bill that would have taken a carbon price and lowered payroll taxes with it. It was a robust bipartisan conversation and it flatlined as dead as after a heart attack in 2010. Because in 2010, the Supreme Court did something unprecedented. They decided a case called Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission, and they decided, contrary to all of American history, contrary to the period of disgusting corporate corruption that caused Teddy Roosevelt to be a national hero fighting against that corruption, that caused the whole progressive movement to emerge back then, that Corporations couldn't possibly corrupt the public process. It was legally impossible 
for corporations to corrupt the public process. And therefore, open the doors. Spend all you want. Nothing could possibly go wrong. Well, the primary ignorant folly of the Citizens United decision is that if a big special interest is allowed to spend unlimited amounts of money, what else is it obviously and necessarily allowed to do? It is obviously and necessarily allowed to threaten or promise to spend unlimited amounts of money. And if the spending is going to be public and everybody's going to have a chance to be accountable about it, those threats and promises are never going to be. And their strategy was to shut down the Republican Party, to punish every single Republican who would work with us on climate. And they have done it. There is not a partisan divide in Congress on climate change. What has happened is, if you remember, remember anybody remember the movie Men in Black? Remember the alien who lands in the field in the farm? Next thing you know, he's in the skin in the overalls of the farmer and walking around. That's the fossil fuel industry in the Republican Party. It has more or less inhabited its skin and its overalls, and now it walks around controlling the Republican Party. And if anybody tries to cross them, they'll go after it. If you read about Myron Ebel, one of the comments that was made about him in the press was that it was his job to enforce this orthodoxy in the Republican Party. We have to free the people in the Republican Party, and there are probably 8 to 12 of them in the Senate, from this control and from this power. And that means that corporate America has to stand up. And I'll close with this point, because you may think that because a great many American corporations have wonderful climate policies, that they come and do something about it in Congress. You may think that because 154 major American corporations signed the Paris Act on Climate Pledge for President Obama, that they do something in Congress. They don't. They don't. Even the good ones don't show up. TechNet, the lobbying group for Apple, Google, Microsoft, and a whole array of, get this, green energy companies came in to lobby us earlier this year. How many times do you think they mentioned climate change in their lobbying package and in their presentation? Seven or eight different issues. Zero. None. Lumber and timber industry came in, right? Pine beetles in the pine forests out west. Northeastern hardwoods moving north out of the plots of land that they own. How many times do you think they mentioned climate change in their presentation? Zero. The property casualty insurance industry writes the checks when nature goes haywire. They came in to lobby me. How often do you think they mentioned climate change in their lobbying materials or in their presentations? Never. Coca-Cola and Pepsi are two of the best companies on climate change that exist. Pepsi even lobbies a little bit through a little group called Ceres that tries to lobby. It's learning. It's kind of an incubator outfit. Then they have their real lobbying clout through something called the American Beverage Association. If you try to tax sugary drinks, the American Beverage Association will rise up in great anger and ire and come to see you and come with great force and vigor. But on climate change, they have never lifted a finger. And worst of all, the money that Coke and Pepsi send to the American Beverage Association goes through the American Beverage Association and on to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to pay for the American Beverage Association seat on the U.S. Chamber of Commerce board. And the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is my most inveterate, implacable foe on getting anything done on climate change. So the net lobbying presence of Coke and Pepsi, two of our best companies on climate policy in Congress, is way net negative against their own stated position. And until and unless that changes, no Republican is going to budge because they look out at a field and don't see a single friend there for them. Walmart won't talk to the senators in Arkansas. Coca-Cola won't talk to the senators in Georgia. The VF Industries, the people who make North Face and all sorts of really high-tech great clothing and are very green themselves, won't talk to the senators from North Carolina. We have to put pressure on the good guys in corporate America to not abandon hope, all ye who enter here, when you get to Congress. That will make a very, very big difference. Then you will see the Republicans start to come back to us, and then we will have a debate that is worthy of this great country. 
It is not worthy of the United States of America to allow a special interest, no matter how big, to sabotage the operation of one of our branches of government to protect its profits. That is a significant evil in a country that markets itself to the world and presents itself to the world as an example, as a city on a hill. There is a price to be paid for that even beyond the price to be paid for climate disaster. So with those happy thoughts, I'll be glad to take your questions. But the point is, we can win this. People need to come off the sidelines. People and companies need to come off the sidelines. And if people and companies come off the sidelines, we win this. We're going to write to questions briefly. This book, The Narrow Edge, A Tiny yep. Bird, An Ancient Crab. That's it. Deborah Kramer, are you here? I love you. I love your book. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. As you probably I know, gave it to Chris Coons when we went to uh, Delaware together to see them. So you have been on a secret channel of channeling crabs and tiny birds. Yeah. And the Wilson's Phalarope in Utah is another one, although it's a slightly different story. Okay, sea of hands again. Uh, Colleen, I saw you first, maybe I try that. Hi, good evening, Senator. I just wanted to thank you very much for your thoughtful comments on climate change. It's refreshing to uh, hear you talk about the plankton stock versus the stock market. Yeah. So I thank you very much for that. Um, I'm retired military. Thank you. Uh, you're very welcome. Um, I'm former White House employee, and I'm headed out to Standing Rock in two days. Um, Stay warm. I, Stay dry. <laughs> I'm working on that still. Uh, still a little shopping to do. Um, but I'd, I'd like to understand what your uh, stance is on the Dakota Access Pipeline, and if we can count on your support, and if you've made any public comments in support of that. There's a lot of suffering going on. I understand. The public comment that I've made has been to urge the Department of Justice to go out and make sure that the peace is kept. Uh, we had a briefing on this in the caucus the other day, and uh, there was considerable concern that although not, no lives have yet been lost, that lives will be lost if things are not managed. And that, so that's been the, the step that I've taken. How about, do you have any specific views on the, the pipeline itself? My focus has been on trying to change this market dynamic. I mean, we're going to be facing Dakota pipelines forever, unless and until we get a carbon price, and unless until we break the lock of the fossil fuel industry on Congress. So that's where I'm going to focus my fire. I think that there is a chance that that happens, even under a Trump presidency. I think there's a chance that that happens. Bear in mind that he wrote that ad seven years ago with three of his children, saying that the science of climate change was irrefutable and that the consequences were catastrophic and irreversible, and signed his name and his children's name. So I have not given up hope, but I can only do so much. I think my time is well spent fighting in Congress to break the grip of the fossil fuel industry and to get a carbon fee passed. That's my focus. Thank you. Hi, I'm going to talk about the elephant in the room, which is the recent uh, election. Um, I don't think anything can change until we can get to a democracy where the person who gets the most votes wins. And I'm wondering if um, you have any hope or any direction on There's a couple of different ways they're going about uh, getting rid of the Electoral College. One of them is state by state, and I think Rhode Island's already signed on to that. I think we have. Where you're going to give uh, the We'd your be electoral for it because we're totally ignored in presidential elections. Everybody, the yeah, Republicans I know you assume are. we're going Democrat, <laughs> and the Democrats assume we're going Democrat, so they won't send us a yard sign or a, or a bumper sticker. We get right. totally bypassed. Yeah, I'm from Connecticut, I know. Yeah. Uh, right, so I'm wondering if you think, if you see any hope in that state by state process. I know that a change to the Constitution would take a long, long time. Yeah. Um, but it's happened too many times now, and twice in my lifetime, yeah. that the winner didn't win. Yeah, I, I think it sends a significant signal. I think it expands the electorate a lot. And I think that in a lot of the states that are foregone conclusions for Democrats, if in California, New York, and Rhode Island, and Connecticut, we thought that our votes would not just tip the Electoral College our way, which we already assume it's going to do, but would actually influence the national outcome, you could have much, much bigger turnouts in those states. And there's a very distinct bias, I believe, in the Electoral College in terms of a, a population discount 
that works against us. So the numbers are even actually worse, I think, for us than uh, the current election results would indicate. If you switched over, I think we'd win by a lot, under the same circumstances, same candidates, we'd win by a lot larger public margins because more people would come out more enthusiastically in more big states and be Democrats. Uh, I'd like to point out that uh, in order to get our foot in the door on renewables and to get uh, the fossil fuel industry uh, on the defensive or off our back, yeah. we're going to have to create a national smart grid with energy storage. In other words, we've got to be able to store the electricity yeah. after we produce it through solar or wind. Yeah. And that's not going to happen by uh, industry. Yeah. They, d they have no interest in doing that. Very the little. government's going to have to do it. So yeah. how are we going to get the government to create a smart grid with energy storage? Well, I think there are, uh, there are three ways at this. One is through the local public utility commissions. This is traditionally a state-by-state -state issue. When I first got started, my first job in the Attorney General's office as a little squeaky new lawyer was to do that work. I did the regulatory work for the office. I did public utilities. I did insurance regulation, all that stuff. And so I, I have lived that world, and there are very different public utility commissions or public service commissions around the country. Some of them are completely in tow to the fossil fuel industry or to the big uh, electric uh, providers in their state. But some of them are pretty interesting and are doing some pretty interesting things. And I think their leadership is going to move in the right direction because once this stuff gets approved and authorized, by them and f you figure out a way to fund it properly, it's really good for people. I mean, people are really happy about it. So it's, wow, you can do that? And then other people say, well, that's a good thing. Why don't we have that here and, uh, and on you go? So um, that would be the, the first thing. The second thing I'd say is that um, the grid operators are doing a reasonably good job about figuring out the logarithms that allow them to determine how to balance wind and solar and other supplies. Wind actually doesn't all shut off at once. The wind isn't blowing someplace, it's blowing someplace else, and there are patterns to that, and they can read those patterns, they can look at the data, and we just heard this week that uh, MidAmerican, the company that runs most of the wind in Iowa and is a big Warren Buffett-owned utility, has just gotten permission for 2,000 more megawatts of wind in Iowa, which will take Iowa from 30% plus wind to 80% wind. And they couldn't be doing that if they hadn't figured out at the grid operator how to make sure that that much wind turned into the capacity that they need at all times and met their capacity uh, requirements. So. And they've done some of that, I think they may do through storage, but some of it is simply knowing when the wind is going to be where and adapting to that and beginning to take advantage of. There, there are lots of unknowns, but there are also lots of knowns in where and when the wind is going to be, and they've got that developed. So I think that uh, helps solve it. And then, you know, you've got people like Elon Musk who's developing this really terrific battery solution, which not only has the benefit of being able to take you off the grid, but has the benefit of not having to have a generator if the outside power goes down so that after a storm, you know, you can be the lights on on the block and people kind of like that. So you may, you may, but I'm, I, I need to explore more what the ISO, the independent service operator serving Iowa, how they run their logarithms to make sure that with 80% wind, they can provide 100% of the power demand of of that state. And I think it's really just a question of having multiple sources and portfolio theory and very good data, and they can predict and know what's going to be on when. Okay. So, uh, Laurie Timmerman, I'm an international development specialist specializing in Africa, and it's kind of a, a following the money. Um, there's a Swiss researcher who studied corporations and determined that 150 companies, two fifths, are financial institutions own 80% of the world's wealth. And um, so with that, we have you know, our whole uh, banking sector, 
financial collapse in 2008 with no prosecutions for um, any perpetrators in contrast to Iceland who used a US um, savings and loan expert to go through their um, takedown of bankers and arrests, arrests of bankers. So um, it's kind of like David Corton's book, When Corporations Rule the World, and I, I think we're there, but behind the corporations is like who owns the corporations? Don't, I'm actually writing something on the extent to which corporations rule our country. And the highlights are that when the Founding Fathers established the Constitution, there weren't corporations around. The big corporations that caused trouble, like the South Sea Bubble and the uh, corporation that more or less ruled India as a principality, hadn't really come over here. They didn't have any effect. And the Hudson's Bay Company and the Massachusetts Bay Company had either collapsed or were operating way far away in far away Canada. So when we founded our country, we took into account a lot of different threats, but we never took into account the threat of the corporation. And it grew to the point where we had the progressive revolution under Teddy Roosevelt because corporations had taken over everything. And corporate corruption was everywhere. And the history books are replete with this. This is not something that is in dispute or unknown. I mean, this was the big fight of that era. And then we've kind of reopened the doors little by little, first through the Supreme Court in the Massachusetts case, and then further down in the Vallejo case, and then ultimately the blow the whistle, all bets are off in Citizens United. But they control our elections, either directly or through the billionaires that they've heaved up as their owners, making vast fortunes for them that they then spend on the behalf of the corporation, or the trusts and the 501c4s that they then build to dif distance themselves. So there's that whole group that's controlling the elections. Then corporate lobbying out weighs all other lobbying in Congress by a ratio of 30 to 1. So it's never a fair fight in Congress unless you've got two corporate behemoths against each other. Like the swipe fee fight between the retailers and the banks, they're the bull elephants charged and you had a real fight on your hands. Otherwise, you basically always get crushed. Regulatory agencies are so beset with corporate influence that the term regulatory capture is now a commonplace both in administrative law and in economics because so many of these administrative agencies get captured by the corporations that they're supposed to regulate, again, because the money is so big. The corporations are desperately trying to get rid of the jury in America, and civil jury trials have more or less completely collapsed because the jury is the one institution that the founders set up to go after, to protect regular people, not from government. Most of the Constitution was set up to protect regular people from government. This was the piece that was set up to protect regular people from other wealthy and more powerful people. Because you couldn't fix a jury. Twelve come together one time and then they're done. They're not a repeat player that you can give jobs to their son-in-law and promise them a nice retirement and slip the money under the table. In fact, if you try to even talk to a juror, it's a crime. Tampering with a jury is a crime. Tampering with the rest of us is business as usual for these guys. <laughs> so when they go after the jury, it's, a, it's an important signal of what they're going after. And then, of course, they've created this whole alternate reality in which tobacco isn't really all that bad for you, climate change is a liberal hoax, don't worry about neonicotinoids, the bees are just dying from other stuff. And until you absolutely know what's going on, we are not going to budge and we're going to send out this, this avalanche of lies through a whole multi-tentacled hydra of different organizations that obscure the common center, which is the industry that wants to protect its business. And all of that works at the same time and stacks up against us. So in many respects, the biggest danger of Donald Trump is that because he is such a sort of boisterous, flamboyant, almost nonsensical character, he is always the sparkly object in the room. And the press can't resist, and the public can't resist. Oh, look, he said this stupid thing. And we all go look at it. <laughs> and in the meantime, all of these corporate encroachments in the legislature, in our elections, 
in the very structure of our government, in our administrative agencies, constantly, silently, increasing, pushing, 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 pushing. They never stop because for them this is a profitable enterprise. For us, for Gene, back there, League of Conservation Voters, he doesn't make money when he fights these guys. He has to go out and get more. He's got to be like constantly harassing people. Please give me money. I need your help. They make money. And if we don't catch on to that insidious infiltration of our government through this skein of corporate power, Donald Trump is going to be the least of our worries. And now, frankly, the battle between Trump and Koch is going to be a very interesting one. Trump won it, but watch the Kochs run it. Okay. On so that you, note, yes. Battles. I just want to say as thank you're you. leaving. Well, we, you know, let's, let's go wild. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.